Well, welcome to Worship with Westminster this Easter day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, it is always such an amazing thing to, to gather on this Sunday morning to, to remember the story uh, that all of the brokenness in our world is not the final word, but that, that God in his great mercy and grace sent his son to us, that Jesus took upon himself our brokenness and uh, died for our sake and was victorious in conquering and trampling over the grave. So as we gather this morning, we gather as a people of hope, as a people of, of change and transformation, and as a people who, uh, who embrace the fullness of life. We are so glad that you are with us. Whoever you are, welcome. We are glad that, that we can worship uh, on this day together. So uh, let's join together first our hearts and minds in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just give you glory and, and praise and thanksgiving for this day and all that it means, Lord, that, that Christ is triumphant over death, and that means uh, that for us as well, Lord, our stories uh, are not going to end in brokenness and death, but uh, fully uh, will we'll, uh, lean into your transformation and glory and uh, goodness, Lord, and the eternal uh, blessings that you have prepared for us. So may we get just a taste of that this morning, Lord. Uh, that your presence would be uh, tangible to our hearts, Lord, uh, and that we would truly rejoice with the fullness of who we are. You are good and glorious, Lord. We love you. We worship you in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's worship God together. Let's sing.
This is Resurrection Sunday, and yet when we look at our world, it doesn't always seem like a resurrection world, right? I'm not sure this would come as a surprise to anyone, but we seem to be living in a complicated and highly anxious world right now. It is not an Easter kind of world. People are stressed like never before. Although I have to admit, uh, I, I don't know how all these researchers can really hope to compare stress levels today to say the stress levels of people in first century Palestine under Roman rule. They didn't do so many polls back then. Might be more accurate to say that uh, people right now are more stressed than in recent human history. But I guess the real point is that we, we don't just seem to be doing really well as a society. We are not flourishing as humanity. I mean, you think in an age where people are more materially prosperous than ever before with more possessions, connections to resources and information, with more scientific and technological achievements, with more freedom than ever before, that we would also be happier than ever before. But the research says we're not. In fact, it's kind of actually the opposite. Depression right now is at an all-time all, all high, and that is worldwide, although it does seem to be a little bit worse here in the Western world. And incidentally, that's not just the number of people who say they're feeling depressed. It's actually the measuring clinical levels. Nearly one in three adults report having uh, been clinically diagnosed with depression at some point in their, in their lifetime, and nearly one in five being treated currently for depression. And this is especially a problem among our young people where the depression rate has more than doubled or almost doubled in the last 10 years. And where's all this unease coming from? Well, we can lay it at a lot of different places. I mean, social media, the pandemic, messy world happenings. I mean, a big reason this year is actually found in politics. Recent research found that 60% of voters feel little or no hope in the future of politics. It's not going anywhere good, they think. And about the same number of people see no good options when they look at the candidates. And more than that actually say they just feel exhausted even thinking about politics. You know, one of the, the questions that was asked of people in this research was an open-ended, what one word or phrase would you use to describe politics in the U.S. these days? The top five answers were, in order, divisive, corrupt, messy, chaotic, and bad. Not a single good word made the top 16, although one swear word did. That can't be good, especially if we see politics as being a way to change the shape of our world. Now, I feel at this point in time that I should do my civic duty and remind you that while politics is not the answer, not the only answer, it is still an answer to change our world. And you should still vote. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself here as well. But please, I beg of you, when you vote, vote only based on the character and mission of Jesus Christ for, for the good of the world, who he was. As a Christian, when we look at the ballot, if the issues or the candidates do not reflect Jesus or reflect his heart or character, then please, we, we should not go there. 
And I know that that makes it a lot harder to fill in those little bubbles on the ballot. But remember, Christians are meant to be integrated in every aspect of our life. There should be no difference between the church us and the school us, or the work us, or the private us, or the voting us. All right, I'm going to stop now, get off my soapbox, and wait for the exciting emails to roll in. So where was I? Right, the world is a little complicated right now. And people are feeling that. They are wondering where they can go for answers. And it seems to be pushing some buttons in our lives. You know, last week, uh, Derek mentioned Billie Eilish's song from the movie Barbie. Uh, the song, What Was I Made For? You know, it won the best song at the Grammys, the Golden Globes, and the Oscars. And, it, and according to an interview with Eilish, it is a song that is about the struggle for identity and belonging and how we often tie ourselves into knots trying to please others and yet never feel like we're enough. Do you ever feel that way? You know, at, at one awards ceremony, Eilish said, I, I want to dedicate this song to anyone who experiences hopelessness and the feeling of existential dread and feeling like, what's the point and why am I here and why am I doing this for? Not sure if that's exactly right, but anyway, how often do you hear a, a contemporary musical artist talking about things like existential dread? But and it's great that she, you know, dedicates the song to all those people who are really wrestling with these things in life. The problem is that while the song might bring some sense of catharsis, I mean, knowing that other people are also experiencing existential dread, it doesn't actually answer any questions. And as Derek pointed out last week, neither does the movie. But, you know, we actually think, we in the church actually think that there is a good answer to those questions and that that answer is an important part of our calling as a church to help people to find those answers. We believe, first of all, that we were actually made. We are not an accident and we are not random. We were designed intentionally by a good God to function in certain ways and that human beings are at their best when we are living into those ways. And this is what we've been studying as a church over the past several weeks during the season of Lent. You know, we believe that as a church, we are called to help people to find purpose in Jesus and that we can do that through our genuine relationships with each other. We are made, we are made to relate. You know, humans do not do well alone. We are made to belong to each other in loving, committed, genuine relationships. We are made to create. We are, as people made in the image of, of a creator, we are also meant to bring beauty and order into our world, to make things that bring meaning. We're made to celebrate, to, to celebrate one another and to celebrate the good things that God has done and given us in this world to practice thanksgiving and to practice laughing together, to sing together, to worship together, to experience joy. We are made to demonstrate the, the character and the goodness of God, to reflect God's love and meaning and grace to one another into our world, to embrace the fruit of the Spirit, your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're, we're meant to reflect these in our daily lives, to demonstrate God's goodness. And we're made to collaborate with God, to use our own forms of power and authority, which we've been given, to, to use them in stewardship, to shape and build our world in positive ways that reflect God's goals, God's purposes for good. All these things God made us for. And they are an important part of what it means to be a human being. They're wired into us as human beings. And actually, as we've been talking about over these last weeks, when we live out those things, we push back against the darkness and against the dissatisfaction that drives so many of those statistics that I mentioned earlier, so many of the questions we wrestle with. You know, healthy relationships deliberately using our creativity, choosing to practice joy and thankfulness instead of cynicism, you know, serving others and in general displaying Jesus and his character, and working with God to bless the world, these things seem to be wired into us as human beings, into our nature, and they help us to push back against anxiety and depression and all of the 
harm and hurt of our world. In fact, they just generally transform our lives and our world, both mentally and physically bringing better health. They're what we're made for. So is that enough then? Are these things all that we need? Can you think of any problems that might kind of lurk behind those things or, or might you know, lurk above those things? What might be a problem? Well, how about this picture? Graves. You know, these things are all great, but they're all also things that end when we end in the grave. I mean, yes, we are made to relate, but how many of you have had that beautiful, wonderful relationships with people that you dearly loved only to have that relationship ended by the tragedy of death of the one you loved. Well, so have I. Many times we've lost people and that relationship covered by the grave. And yes, we were made to create. But how many people who have lived and created amazing things, who have shown creativity in life, well, where did they all end up? No matter how creative, no matter what a genius they were, they still, their work is ended when they end in the grave. You know, we're meant to celebrate together, but our joy seems to be pretty firmly swallowed up by death. And on and on it goes. And this is something that we all have to face. The grave stands there like a punctuation mark at the end of our life. There's no avoiding it. But you know, I don't actually think we were made for the grave. We were not made for death. We were not made for this. And it's not just because I believe that because my Bible tells me so, although the Bible does actually say that we were not made for death. It is a foreigner. It is an interloper into our existence. But you know, pe people naturally rebel against this feeling of death. It feels so foreign to us. Why should it? I mean, if, if we're naturally just, you know, random people who will then eventually run out, it should be normal. But, you know, I don't know many people for whom death doesn't feel instinctively wrong. We were not made for death. And death, good news, will not have the final word. We were made for more. Of course, there are many smaller deaths that we experience along the way, that, that the ways that those good things that I mentioned earlier, you know, the things we were made for, they, they can be thwarted or sidetracked or ruined by, by these little deaths, by the, by the brokenness, by the hurt, by the shame that, that comes from human sinfulness, by estrangement, by hurt and shame, and just the general mess of humanity. We, we see this happen all the time as well. We see relationships broken. We see creativity smothered. We see our joy um, lacking because of the hurt of what it means to be human as well. But you know what? You were also not made for shame and hurt or brokenness. And Good news, these things will not have the final word either. That's what Easter is, a, is about in a, in a big way. It's death and sin and shame. These things are temporary. They will be defeated. They have been defeated. We were made for more. We were made for so much more. Again, this is what this morning is about. And so let's go ahead and take a look once more at the resurrection of Jesus. This story, uh, in this case, told by the Apostle John. We're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And as always, listen for the living God speaking to you. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw 
and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Well, this is God's word for us. Amen. Okay, so let's just pause here for a minute and deal with this unexpectedly open tomb. Let's just start with why Mary is there before anyone else. You know, the the women were there at the crucifixion. In fact, John 19, just the chapter earlier, a few verses earlier than this passage, uh, says this. So the soldiers did these things. That means that they were were dicing uh, for for, uh, Jesus' clothing. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, the women in the first century were kind of considered non-persons, which is why they could be there safely at the foot of the cross without fearing the Romans. Now, we're not going to go too far into the details except to point out that Jesus treated women very differently, that they were valued by him in ways that their own culture did not value them. And that's already a big deal. You know, women were a valued, respected part of Jesus' ministry, and they traveled with him and, the, and, and with the disciples against Jewish custom, because they were not married to the disciples. They should not have been with them. Uh, but they actually supported the ministry from their own means. In fact, in many ways, Jesus' ministry completely depended upon these women who were listed throughout the Gospels, Mary being one of those women. Uh, this is from Luke chapter 8, uh, towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, listen to this list. It sounds a lot like the one we just heard. So soon after, it says, uh, Jesus went on through uh, cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Again, so why did these women follow? Well, partly because they were invited, which is, again, a big thing. Rabbis don't invite women to come with them. But also a huge reason that they were with Jesus was because Jesus had already changed their lives. He had healed them. Notice that Mary had been freed from seven demons, although the the number seven might just be a symbolic number, meaning total or complete, that she was completely oppressed by demons. And Jesus came along and changed Mary's life. Not only had she been freed from possession, but she also had been freed from this hard past. She was a a new person, not defined by that past. And, And beyond that, she becomes an actual disciple. Following Jesus... And, and central to his movement. You know, when Mary calls him Rabboni, our, our ESV says it means teacher, but that's not actually what it means. Rabbi is teacher. It actually translates not as teacher or the teacher, but specifically my teacher. But Mary was saying that she was a disciple, that he was her rabbi. 
Now think about what Jesus meant to Mary then. Here, here's a person who really saw her, truly valued her, and had given her a distinct sense of purpose and meaning in a way that the world around her could not or would not. As she was respected, she was honored, she was a part of something significant that was bringing real change, not just to her own life, but to other people's life, uh, lives now as well. She saw him healing all these people. She saw him teaching. She provided for this movement as they traveled from place to place, and she watched as Jesus changed people's lives and opened their minds and healed them and freed them from their burdens and gave them hope. And she knew that what she was doing, this woman living in first century Palestine, that she was investing in something that mattered, and that is a huge deal, a huge deal. And then you add to that the personal relationship. You know, Jesus' relationship with his disciples, all of his disciples, was not like that of other rabbis. It was way more personal, far more all-consuming. I mean, it wasn't just an, a means to an end where, where people were learning from him so they could go off and do their own thing. It was, they were entering into a relationship in which he never ceased to be rabbi, in which he would always be their Lord. And it gave them a whole new identity. And Mary, as a woman, was invited into that kind of relationship, a completely new life, a completely new identity rooted in Jesus, her rabbi. Only now Jesus is gone. She stood there and watched with her own eyes. She saw with her own eyes as he was crucified by the Romans, as so many others had been crucified before, and as he was laid in a tomb as everyone else had been before. It, it, was, it wasn't just her teacher in that tomb. It was her identity. It was her life. It was all of her hopes and dreams and joys. It was the thing that gave meaning to who she was, lying dead in a tomb. Have you ever felt that? I mean, the crumbling of everything that meant anything to you. Have you ever seen your identity, your very identity, just swiped away? Now, if you have ever lost a loved one, you, you know a little of what that means, that the emptiness of, of not knowing exactly who you are now that that person's not there anymore. I, I mean, you know that's the relational side of things. But add to that the, the fear and confusion, the loss of the dream, the loss of meaning and purpose. D does she go back to who she was before? Are the seven demons waiting in the wings to, to take over her life again? He's gone. What would that mean to her? And that's why she stays there weeping. Her whole world has been gutted. I mean, have you been there? Just gutted, feeling still broken, worried that you will never be enough and not knowing if there is any way for things to change, to be better, to feeling the hopelessness as so many people seem to be feeling these days. You know, the cross was a blight in that world. It was an indicator of a world at its worst. I mean, if there had ever been a time where people could think that the world was out of control and hopeless, it's when the Creator hung there, dying and alone and forsaken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only we know that God wasn't done. And he's still not done. For all of the Marys of the world, we need to know that he's still not done. No matter how grim it might look, he's still not done. Easter tells us that he has more, that we were made for more. But Mary doesn't know that yet, so she runs, which is scandalous behavior, by the way. To run in, in the ancient world was scandalous. And, and she fetches Peter and John, and they run back to the world again, scandalous. And they see and they consider, and John says that they believe. But we're not exactly sure what they believe. I mean, they see and they believe and they go home. I mean, they just wander away. They believe, but it doesn't look like they're convinced what it means. Like, there's no action. There's no sense in which, oh, this is really good. We, maybe they just believe that the tomb was empty. We, we don't know. But, you know, sometimes I think we actually approach the resurrection this way, too. I mean, we, we believe, we, we read the text. Oh, he's out of the tomb. That's great. But we're not sure what it means for my life today. You know, there's all sorts of theological significance in the picture that we're given in this passage. 
like for example, the two angels, the one at the head and the one at the feet, looking very much like the picture of the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels facing each other, um, where the priest in between them, the priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice and where God said that he would meet his, his people in forgiveness there. It's called the seat uh, um, the, the mercy seat, it's called the mercy seat. Uh, only God is now meeting people in between those angels in a different way, right? With this picture of complete and total forgiveness because the sacrifice has been completed once and for all. It's done, there's no more. But that's actually, that theological picture, that's great, that's a beautiful picture. It's not the real picture we're given here, I think. I, I think that John gives us immense detail that helps us to understand the heart of God for us. You know, this interaction here, so very personal and tender. That's what John emphasizes. I mean, he takes his, you know, metaphorical camera and he focuses in on this relationship that Jesus has with Mary the Magdalene. Mary is there weeping because her heart has been torn to pieces, because her hope is lost, because she doesn't know who she is anymore. And she can't even recognize Jesus when he appears. And, and in that moment, as she's struggling and saying, is it, you know, where is he? Would you, would you tell me where he is? Jesus then preaches the shortest of sermons. All of this incredible meaning and theological significance that's condensed down into a single word, Mary. What does he say in this sermon? He says, I, I know you, I love you, I'm here, there's more, right? There's more, you were made for more. And as, as he uh, said earlier in the gospel, my sheep know my voice. And Mary recognizes his voice when he says that. She recognizes him and she becomes the first person to experience the personal presence of the risen Lord. As she turns to him, human history takes a turn as well towards hope away from death and meaninglessness and sin and all the brokenness that cuts us off from our humanity, all those ways that our purposes and what we were made for are robbed from us, that cut off our relationships and our creativity, that kill our joy, that erase our place in the world, all of those things are no longer the most important thing. Because Jesus is there and he speaks her name and she, Jesus is more than death. He's more final than death. Jesus is more final than shame. Jesus is more final than all of the mistakes and hurts and brokenness. Jesus will be final. Now, just, it's just a few more details here. Jesus says, don't cling to me. It's what we read in the ESV. The Greek literally means do not keep holding on to me. It's present. That she's doing it means what? That she's holding on to him. In her joy, she has embraced him. And he lets her. He is not an untouchable ghost. He's not just a phantom. He is flesh and blood, and he is a real and affectionate human being who loves the people that he loves, including you and me. But as, as much as that is important, it can't go on forever. See, Mary is being given a purpose, re, reinstated into this mission, you know, the Easter story shows us that Jesus has become accessible to Mary once more, and that's beautiful. Her life can continue to change and grow and be all, or become all that she was meant to be, just like it had been done before. But now she's also tasked to take that transformation that she had experienced, that is not ended, and to take it out and share how accessible he is to others, including his disciples. And so she becomes the apostle to the apostles. And so are we sent out. You know, uh, there's a guy in the early, uh, early years after, uh, after the Christian movement started uh, named Celsus. He was an, an early Roman critic. He was a philosopher, but a critic, uh, a, a vocal critic of Christianity. And he wrote about two main criticisms he had with the resurrection account. The first was that it was women who shared the story. He said, how can you expect us to believe something that it was just hysterical women? Sharing it. And the second was that while the, the crucifixion happened in public, everybody could see that. The resurrection was very quiet, and only a few people experienced it. So let's, let's take those two apart. You know, women in, in Jesus' time, again, were not honored or valued. In fact, they could not legally be witnesses in court. And that has meant 
some people who, who would doubt the Christian story, especially early on in that misogynistic era. Although it's, it's actually still a belief that's sometimes held in the modern era. Um, the uh, late noted atheist Christopher Hitchens uh, said this at one point in time. He said very scornfully, the resurrection. You know, most of the witnesses to this are women. Illiterate, stupid, deluded, hysterical females of the kind who in the Jewish court at that time would have had about as much of a chance of being listened to as they would in an Islamic court today. That's, that's his quote. Of course, women, how could you believe that? That's actually one of the reasons that you can believe the gospels to be true. Why would the disciples or the, the writers of the New Testament invent a story if they were making it up in which uh, characters who were not valued by the culture would have been placed so prominently? Why would they have written that down except because it's what happened? Because Jesus valued those women the way that their own culture did not and therefore included them in this picture. You know, I, I would say that the, the way the resurrection takes place reflects the values of God's heart, not for spectacle, but for the individual precious people that he calls by name, male and female, no matter who they are, no matter what their story is. For those moments, you know, be, for those moments between the tomb and when she gets to the apostles, Mary Magdalene was the whole church the only one who knew the story of the resurrection. Isn't that amazing? And, and as for it being public, yes, Jesus' shame and punishment took place loudly and publicly, and his resurrection takes place quietly and in person because he's not doing it by bulk. He meets each person's heart individually. He, he has a resurrection in Peter's heart, in John's heart, in Mary's heart. He, later on, he meets with Thomas. He meets with these other disciples. He meets with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He meets with Mary. He meets inherently with them personally saying, I am here for you. I have a, pers a purpose for you. You're not nameless. You're not random. You are not generic. I believe that the resurrection, that Easter morning tells us this amazing truth, several amazing truths. First of all, that no matter who you are, it is for you, and it is for you to share. Second of all, that all of those things in life, the shame, the hurt, the betrayals, the, the brokenness, including death, none of those things can keep you from being the human being you were meant to be, because God still has purposes for you. And finally, that no matter who you are, he will meet you in your life. He meets you there and invites you to be a participant in what he's doing. This is Easter. We were made for more than shame. We were made for more than brokenness, more than sinfulness. We were made for more than death. And the glory of Christ's resurrection says that that purpose is still being worked out in you. Your life is made for more. Amen. I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation was only the start Now I am chosen I'm free and forgiven I have a future And it's worth the living I wasn't made to be tender
Why, why would we allow ourselves to, to just sit in shame or brokenness to let the, the problems of our world define who we are when we have been made for so much more? Friends, whoever you are, whatever your story, whatever your situation, I, I pray that, that the, the truth of Easter might resonate in your heart, that you could know that you have a God who sees you and knows you and loves you and calls you by name, inviting you into his life and that that life would resonate through yours uh, to the glory of God and to help heal the people around you as you share the hope. May God bless you. May God uh, continue to grow you, strengthen you, and use you. Amen. <laughs>